Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anthea Hancox. As CEO of the Scanlon Foundation Research Institute, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the national launch of the 2022 Mapping Social Cohesion Report. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we're meeting today. In our case, in South Melbourne, the Yalak Ut Willem clan of the Bunmurong. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and to all First Nations people and any who are joining us today. And if you're joining us from somewhere else in Australia, please feel free to include the name of the lands from which you are joining us in the chat function to the right of your screen. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge Peter Scanlon, the chairman of the Scanlon Foundation, members of the Scanlon Foundation Board, Has Dalal, Executive Director of the Australian Multicultural Foundation, Chin Tan, the Race Discrimination Commissioner, and Diane Hers, the CEO of the Social Research Centre, and other distinguished guests joining us today. Firstly, and importantly, I would also like to take this moment to acknowledge the Mapping Social Cohesion Report's outgoing author, Emeritus Professor Andrew Marcus, who retired from this role earlier in the year. Professor Marcus was the inaugural lead researcher behind the Mapping Social Cohesion Survey. It was his work that conceived the survey and his efforts that have ensured it is its ongoing integrity and international benchmarking since 2007. Many of you will be familiar with Andrew's work in this space, in particular his very insightful commentary and his ability to help us understand the changing world around us. He has been instrumental in drawing our attention to the importance of social cohesion for Australia as both a strength and something to be carefully fostered. Although he has always helped us to understand its fragility and challenges, he has also ensured that we were able to recognise that our embrace of diversity has been a significant strength and one we should value. We are extremely grateful for the enormous commitment and contribution that Professor Marcus has made to Australia and to expanding our knowledge of the field, and we wish him all the very best in the future undertakings. Now I want to let you know that today's session is being recorded and that the video will be available to download from the Bettycast platform from tomorrow for the next 14 days. So simply return to this same event URL we are streaming from and you can download the content from there. Later in today's program, we'll be running a live Q&A where you can submit a question to our report author. To do so, just type your question into the Q&A function to the right of this screen this function will appear <laughs> once we get underway with today's presentation, so don't go looking for it right now. You'll also be able to give a thumbs up or a like to any of the questions within the Q&A panel that interest you. This will help us prioritise the queries of greatest interest. And we will, of course, do our best to get to as many of those questions as we can in today's session. And finally, if you've picked up some key takeaways from today's session that you feel compelled to share, or if you want to continue the conversation online following today's event, you can do so by following or using the hashtag Social Cohesion Report. Let's begin by taking a look at our short video, summarising some of the major takeaways. The 2022 Mapping Social Cohesion Study comes at a critical time for social cohesion in Australia. The annual national survey recorded a positive spike across several social cohesion indicators over 2020 as the Australian community galvanised in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. But new data reveals that boost in social cohesion is wearing off. The lingering impacts of a global health crisis, combined with geopolitical concerns and growing cost of living pressures, leaves social cohesion in Australia at an important juncture. The 2022 Mapping Social Cohesion Survey provides new insight into how the national mood is shifting in the face of these emerging challenges. Conducted in July 2022, the survey collected the views of almost 5,800 respondents through more than 90 questions on topics including immigration, multiculturalism, major issues facing Australia, government and community life. Let's take a look at some of the major findings from this year's Mapping Social Cohesion Report. 
Despite a boost to national belonging during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, the proportions of people reporting a great sense of national belonging and pride have been steadily declining over the last 15 years and are now lower than at any point in the Mapping Social Cohesion series. 52% in 2022 feel a great sense of belonging in Australia. While the proportion of people who take great pride in the Australian way of life and culture has declined to just 37%. While national belonging is declining, people's sense of belonging at a local level is strong. 82% of people agree that they feel a sense of belonging in their neighbourhood and 66% agree that their neighbourhood has a strong sense of community. Australian support for immigration and multiculturalism has been high since the Scanlan surveys began, but has grown significantly in recent years. The proportion of people who agree that accepting immigrants from many different countries makes Australia stronger has climbed from 63% to 78% over the last four years. Similarly, the proportion who agree that immigrants are good for Australia's economy has increased from 74% to 87%. And in an example of successful multiculturalism playing out in the Australian community, 81% of people in 2022 say they have two or more close friends who come from national, ethnic or religious backgrounds different to their own. The impact of economic uncertainty and cost of living pressures is evident throughout the 2022 findings. When asked the open-ended question, what's the biggest problem facing Australia today? Economic issues dominated responses, mentioned by 39% of people. 37% of people in 2022 described themselves as either poor or struggling to pay bills or just getting along, significantly more than last year. And 35% are dissatisfied with their financial situation, an increase from 29% in 2021. Renewed concerns about economic inequality also contributed to a declining sense of social inclusion and justice in 2022. 36% now strongly agree that the gap in incomes is too large in Australia. And just 14% now strongly agree that Australia is a land of economic opportunity where in the long run, hard work brings a better life. People who are struggling financially and pessimistic about the future report substantially lower levels of national pride and belonging, happiness and social inclusion. This demonstrates the powerful influence of financial well-being on social cohesion. Economic inequalities exacerbated by the current economic climate give rise to social inequalities that in turn drag down overall social cohesion. New survey questions added in 2022 shed light on current attitudes to topical social issues. In one question, respondents were asked how concerned they were about five major global threats to Australia. People were most likely to be very concerned about climate change. While large majorities were at least quite concerned about a severe downturn in the global economy, and in Australia-China relations. In another question, respondents were asked, should an Indigenous voice to Parliament be established? Almost three in five agreed or strongly agreed. Only one in five disagreed, while a similar proportion were neutral. Emerging from the COVID-19 pandemic in a strong position, but facing new global challenges, Australian society is at an important crossroads. The data shows that economic inequalities and concern for national and global issues are weighing heavily on our social cohesion in 2022. Efforts to address these sources of inequality and alleviate the effects of global issues will be a necessary first step in protecting and strengthening our social cohesion in the coming years. Read the full 2022 Mapping Social Cohesion Report at scanlaninstitute.org.au. So a number of very important findings to unpack there. Taking over the role of lead researcher for the Mapping Social Cohesion Program and therefore the author of the 2022 Mapping Social Cohesion Report is Dr. James O'Donnell from the Australian National University. 
As a demographer whose research is focused on understanding and measuring social cohesion within and across neighbourhoods, Dr O'Donnell has considerable experience in the field. His broader research interests include housing and homelessness, labour market and household dynamics, and social and demographic change. We're delighted that James has joined the Scanlon Foundation Research Institute to continue this work into the future. I'm delighted to welcome Dr James O'Donnell to this session to take us through the key findings in more detail for us now. James, thank you so much for being here and thank you for all the work in putting this year's report together. No <laughs> mean feat. I'll now hand over to you to share uh, some of what you've discovered. Thank you, Anthea. What a time to join. COVID-19, social cohesion. Social cohesion increased during the pandemic. However, amidst economic and cost of living pressures, the lingering effects of the pandemic, and global uncertainties and tensions, social cohesion has started to decline. That's our key message from this year's Mapping Social Cohesion study. Now in its 16th year, the Mapping Social Cohesion study is a one of a kind anywhere in the world, a living public record of who we are in Australia, how we connect with one another, the very essence of what holds us together as a society. And with the arrival of the 2022 report, we can expand on the legacy of the Mapping Social Cohesion study in really important and exciting ways. The survey this year was conducted in July. We had more than 90 questions related to social cohesion and related attitudes, behaviours and perceptions. The survey administered to the Social Research Centre's Life in Australia panel had almost 5,800 uh, respondents this year, making it the largest survey of its kind. These days, the Mapping Social Cohesion Survey is largely an online survey, but we also allow for people not online by conducting some telephone interviews as well. This year, we also conducted interviews within communities to understand and gauge the lived experiences of how communities are ma managing and emerging from the pandemic. And the key message is that social cohesion in Australia is at a critical juncture in 2022. Social co cohesion increased during the pandemic. In 2020, Australians were reporting higher levels of belonging, greater trust in government, greater social justice and increased acceptance of people from different backgrounds. But in 2022, cohesion is declining. National pride, belonging and the sense of social justice in Australia is lower than it was before the pandemic. On the positive side though, support for multiculturalism and ethnic diversity is high and continuing to grow. In 2022, almost 9 in 10 people think that multiculturalism has been good for Australia. Also on a positive note, neighbourhood belonging and cohesion remains high and continues to grow. Raising the key question, how we draw on the strength of our neighbourhoods and our support for multiculturalism to improve national level social cohesion. As every year, we measure social cohesion on five key domains. The first domain is the sense of belonging. So the sense of pride and belonging that we have in Australia and the Australian way of life. In this year's survey, we also add some questions on personal connections and neighbourhood belonging. The second domain is the sense of worth. So the sense of personal and financial happiness and well-being. The third domain is social inclusion and justice. The sense of fairness in society and trust in government and institutions. The fourth domain, participation, captures our engagement in political activities such as voting and communicating with members of parliament. In this year's survey, we also add items related to participation in social community and civic groups in society. The final domain is acceptance or injection. So acceptance and support for differences and diversity in Australia and the experience of discrimination. The Scanlon Monash Index of Social Cohesion tracks social cohesion now over a 15 year period, telling us how, we've, how and where we've come from. Focusing just on the last few years, since 2018, we had that spike in cohesion during the pandemic, during 2020. Over a longer period, cohesion was high in that 2007 to 2009 period, reasonably stable over the 2010s. We had a little measured decline in cohesion when we switched from a telephone survey to an online survey. But when we adjust for this interview effect, we see that social cohesion in 2022 is about where it has been throughout the 2020s. So perhaps we're returning to a pre-pandemic normal. Not a bad position to be in, given the historically cohesive nature of Australian society. However, 
a return to a pre-pandemic normal is not inevitable and not to be taken for granted. And there are some warning signs in the data. We're looking at change over time on our key domains. We see just in the last year, social cohesion has declined on four of our five domains. Just in the, from between 2019 and 2022, social cohesion has declined on the social inclusion and justice domain, down by 6.7 points, and on the sense of belonging domain, down by 5.5 points. The sense of worth domain is also below its pre-pandemic levels, but reasonably in line with, with its longer term average. So why this decline in belonging and social inclusion and justice? Well, let's look a look at, take a look at our index of belonging firstly. So it, it, again, it was high in that 2007 period, declined to 2013, and then rel relatively stable over the next five years. Another little decline when we transitioned to a largely online survey. A little peak during the COVID-19 pandemic, but in 2022 it's declining again and is now at lower than it has been at any point in our Mapping Social Cohesion series. So what's driving this? The index of belonging is made up of a few items, including the extent to which people feel a sense of belonging in Australia. So in 2018, 57% of people said they had a sense of belonging in Australia to a great extent. In 2020, that increased to 63% during the pandemic. But in 2022, it's declined to 52%, and again, is now lower than it ever, has ever been in the history of the series. Most people, the vast majority of people, are at least have a, at least a moderate ex sense of belonging in Australia, so that's 87%. But the number of people saying only slightly or not at all on this question also is, if anything, increasing. On that index of social inclusion and justice domain, so similar story. At a high point in 2007, 2009, reasonably stable throughout much of the 2010s, and then COVID hit. And it had quite a large spike. But concerningly, this declined at least as fast. And again, it's now perhaps a at least a little bit lower than it has been at any point in the series. Social inclusion and justice is also made up of a few questions on our survey. So one of them being trust in the federal government. So throughout the 2010s, only around 29% of people said the federal government could be trusted all or most of the time uh, to do the right thing by the Australian people. In 2020, this increased dramatically to 54%. Last year it was 44% and this year 41%. So quite a bit down on its pandemic peak, but still above its longer term average. Relatedly, two thirds of people think that their federal and their state government have been handling the COVID-19 pandemic fairly or very well. Now this is a little bit down from its very lofty heights during 2020, when 80 to 90% of people said that their governments were handling the pandemic very well. But it's still a really healthy majority. However, one in four people think that the government leaders abuse their power all or most of the time. 54% of people think it's at least some of the time. 65% think that elections are fair all or most of the time, meaning that around one third of people don't think that's the case. Growing numbers of people are concerned with economic inequality in Australia. So 36% strongly agree that the gap in incomes between rich and poor is too large. And that declined during the pandemic, but is now higher again and higher than it was before the pandemic. Why are we seeing some of these trends? Well, it's a big research project. Some of the an analysis that we've done for this year's report suggests that the declining sense of national belonging has been felt across society. So declines are reported amongst young and old people, people from high and low socioeconomic backgrounds, particularly people from Australian-born um, backgrounds, but also to a lesser extent to immigrant-born populations as well. The declines, though, have been largest for young and middle-aged groups. Financial pressures are also strongly related to declining belonging. We've seen large declines in belonging for those who are struggling financially or just getting along. So while there might be an element of social and cultural change in the different ways in which we identify with, with Australia, that sense of that relationship between financial stress and belonging is a really concerning sign, particularly in 2022, with our cost of living pressures perhaps affecting the, sen 
extent to which we're connecting with others and with wider society. Again, though, that's at the national level. At the local level, at the neighbourhood level, neighbourhood connections and belonging remain strong. So in 2022, 82% of people feel that they belong in their neighbourhood. 85% think agree that people in their local area are willing to help one another. 83% agree that people from different national or ethnic backgrounds get along well together. And we can see some of the trends in time over the, some of these questions that have been asked now, in this case since 2009. So this is my local area. It's a place where people from different national or ethnic backgrounds get along well together. In the 2020s, 75 to 80 percent of people agreed or strongly agreed with this statement. In 2022, this increased to 84 percent during the height of the pandemic. And in 2022, it's still at that very high level. There are, though, important differences differences in social, express social cohesion across society. And the biggest difference is, is by age. So older adults generally express a higher level of social cohesion than younger adults. There's also an important socioeconomic gradient. So people with a university degree tend to report higher levels of belonging, sorry, not so much belonging, but higher levels of worth, higher levels of social inclusion and justice, higher levels of participation, and higher levels of acceptance. People who have only completed up to year 12 or year 11 and below have much lower sense of social cohesion on these domains. The gradient is even more stark when we look at it by financial situation. So people who say that they're struggling to pay bills or they describe themselves as poor have an average social cohesion score that is five points below the national average. For people who say they're just getting along, it's two points below the national average. And for people who uh, describe themselves as prosperous or very comfortable, it's th three points above the national average, by contrast. The story for immigrant and foreign-born populations is more varied. So people born overseas generally have a higher level of trust in others and trust in government, and a higher level of acceptance of diversity. However, they tend to report a lower level of belonging and participation. But this is largely a function of time, time spent in Australia, building roots and social connections in Australia. So for example, people who've been here for less than 10 years have a much lower sense of belonging than even people who've been here 10 to 20 years or 20, 20 or more years. Similar story for participation. So we see on the left, participation in political activities like communicating with members of parliament. This increases as people have been in Australia for a longer period of time, for both people coming from English-speaking backgrounds and people coming from non-English-speaking backgrounds. Same story, similar story for social participation in social community and civic groups. So in, tw in 2022, only around 40% of people who have been in Australia less than 10 years participate in social and community civic groups, at least among those from a non-English-speaking background. But that group also includes students, people here that are temporarily and people that may be returning home. Those people who stay in Australia longer, for 10 or 20 years or 20 years or longer, their participation in society increases and the gap closes. That leads us to some of our really important results on multiculturalism in Australia. One of the real strengths of the survey in capturing a responses to a multitude of questions and over a really long time series now. And the encouraging sign is that support for multiculturalism and diversity has been increasing and is at record levels in 2022. Nine in 10 people say that multiculturalism has been good for Australia. 80% disagree that it should be possible to reject immigrants on the basis of their race, ethnicity or religion. 78% disagree that immigrants take jobs away. 94% of people agree that someone born outside of Australia is likely to be just as good as a citizen. And these, on all of these measures, they've been increasing over time. We have a whole set of other questions, and the direction has been pointing in a positive direction on all these measures as well. But discrimination is a persistent issue. So in 2022, one in six people experienced discrimination on the basis of their skin colour, their ethnicity, or their religion. This includes one in four people who are born overseas, and one in three people from non-English-speaking backgrounds. 
this 16%, the overall level of discrimination in the last tw 12 months, is similar to what it was last year. Encouragingly, maybe there's a, perhaps a downward decline over time, although pretty stable, and a little bit higher than it was, say, before 2013. Now, the experience of discrimination is mirrored by people who hold prejudicial attitudes towards different groups. So we'll also ask our respondents, would you say your feelings are positive or negative towards immigrants from different countries? More than 90% of people have a positive view of people born in European countries like Italy, Germany, United Kingdom. It drops to 70% for people born in India and to 60% or, or even lower for people born in countries like Ethiopia, Lebanon, China, Iraq and Sudan. We also go about, ask about attitudes towards different people from different religious faiths. In 2022, 29% of people have a somewhat or very negative view of people of, of the Muslim faith. 15% of people have a negative view of Christians. Overall, two in three people hold negative feelings or attitudes to one or more religions and or one of the six non-European immigrant groups in 2022. Encouragingly, this is down a little bit since even just in the last two years. And positive feelings towards people born in China, for example, have increased from 52% of people in 2020 to 61% in 2022. While negative attitudes towards Muslims has declined from 40% in 2020 to 29% in 2022. We also ask people whether they think racism is a problem in Australia. In 2020, the height of pandemic, we asked people whether they thought racism in Australia was a problem during the pandemic. And around 40% 40 of people said that it was either a very big problem or a fairly big problem. In 2021, we dropped that reference to the COVID-19 pandemic and just asked how big a problem is racism in Australia. And 60% of people said that racism was a very big or fairly big problem in Australia. And in 2022, that remains at 60%. So this is a big increase but it perhaps reflects more than anything an increased awareness of racism in Australian society. One of the biggest drivers of this increase between 2020 and 2021 has been increased awareness amongst the Australian-born population. Now, discrimination matters for our social cohesion. So people who have experienced discrimination in the last 12 months report a substantially lower level of social cohesion on the belonging domains, on the sense of worth domain, on social inclusion and justice, and on acceptance and rejection. And importantly, this is after controlling for demographic and socioeconomic characteristics. So what it, what it is in effect saying is that if you were, we were to take two people from a similar age group, from a similar migrant background, with a similar set of socioeconomic characteristics and conditions, the person who has experienced discrimination feels a much lower sense of belonging in Australia a less, lower sense of worth, a lower sense of social inclusion and justice, and a lower of acceptance. Now, it goes without saying that there are a number of major issues nationally and globally that impact on social cohesion in Australia today. Our first question on the survey is, what do you think is the most important problem facing Australia today? Historically, economic issues have been the number one issue. Understandably, during COVID-19, COVID, -19, COVID became the dominant issue, reported by 60% of people in both 2020 and 2021. This dropped down to about 10% of people in 2022. And economic issues have become a dominant issue once again. Environment and climate change has, has moved into the second most commonly cited major problem facing Australia today, followed by housing shortages, and social issues. So the economy is the biggest problem facing Australia for two in five people. This is the highest level ever recorded in the Mapping Social Cohesion Survey. Three quarters of people are concerned about a global economic downturn and financial stress increased sharply between 2021 and 2022. This is at least back to pre-pandemic levels. But 37% of people say they're struggling to pay the bills, they describe themselves as poor, or just getting along. And this is up from 31% last year, but as I say, it's at least as 
only back to a, a pre-pandemic level, keeping in mind the survey was conducted in July. The majority of people are at least optimistic about the future, though around one in, th one in three people are less optimistic. Given the current global environment, we ask about concern for five major geopolitical issues in 2022. So 41% of people are very concerned about climate change, the, the issue for which most people are very concerned. Around 70% of people are at least quite concerned. Three quarters of people are at least quite concerned about Australia-China relations and a severe downturn in the global economy. 60% are concerned about COVID-19 and other potential pandemics. More than 50% are at least quite concerned about a military conflict involving Australia. So there are lots of issues weighing on the Australian population in 2022. We also ask about the voice to parliament. So 59% of people agree or strongly agree that we should amend the constitution to incorporate a voice to parliament. Around one in four, five people disagreed with the statement and a similar proportion were neutral, were unsure. We recorded majority support in all states and territories, and with high support, particularly among young people. Support among foreign-born Australians and non-English speaking populations was also quite high at a similar level to the national average. But it's worth pointing out that 30% of people were, were neutral, undecided, perhaps indicating a need for greater information for these groups. Now, the voice to parliament does have the potential to be a divisive issue. So support does vary quite strongly by political alignment and whether you voted for Labor or the Greens or the Liberal National, Liberal National parties at the election, as well as levels of acceptance and rejection. So people who are generally accepting of diversity and difference in Australia are much more likely to be supportive of the voice to parliament. Now, in saying that, more than almost 90% of people say that the relationship between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and the wider Australian community is very important for Australia as a nation. Now, while this is much lower for people who disagree that with the voice to parliament, note that still 62% of people, of those, of those that say that don't support the voice to parliament, they still believe that relationship between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and the wider community is very important. So while the voice has, a point, has, has the potential to be a vice, divisive issue, there is also great potential to, um, and a need to have a very considered and respectful de debate in the lead up to a referendum. Similar, similar very high proportions who are neutral, so those, even those who are unsure, still very likely to, to believe that relationship is important. Major issues generally have a strong bearing on social cohesion. So attitudes to some of these big major national and global issues are related to social cohesion in Australia. So people concerned about climate change, for example, that continues to, be, uh, continues to fall on social and political divides. Likewise, concern about a severe global down downturn. Those most concerned tend to report a lower level of personal and financial satisfaction. People who are most concerned about climate change also lower sense of belonging, a lower sense of worth and a lower sense of social inclusion and justice in society. But by the same token, a substantially higher level of acceptance and diversity. So there is a potential for social and political and ideological polarisation around these issues that we have to be mindful of and careful of. So social cohesion in Australia is emerging it's a critical issue in 2022, and it's at a critical juncture. The opportunities and threats suggest that a return to pre-pandemic stability is possible, but not inevitable. The history of and some public support for multiculturalism is a great asset to Australia, insulating us from deeper divisions. While well, that sense of neighbourhood co cohesion and that connectedness that we have within our communities and neighbourhoods is a potentially lasting positive legacy of how we collectively responded to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, social and economic inequalities, financial and cost of living pressures, the experience of discrimination and concern for these national and global issues are weighing on social cohesion. We, while we can't address all these issues, we can address some of them and we can try to alleviate the effects of some of them. And in doing so, we can imagine a stronger and more cohesive Australia in the years to come.
Thank you. Thank you so much, James. That was really terrific and, and, and so much information in there. I know there's uh, quite a number of questions that are coming through, so um, we're really looking forward to addressing some of those with you. So, The, um, the first question I can see says, how is uh, national belonging measured? Uh, could this possibly be seen as a positive, especially when, continue, when combined with the uh, rise in belonging at the local level? So national belonging, so we have, well, we have a couple of questions there. So that's the sense of belonging in Australia uh, and the sense of pride in the Australian way of life. And so, and so those have both been declining a little bit over time. Now, what to make of that is, is you know, an important area for, for debate and, and research and, and w what it actually means and whether it does reflect some of those you know, social and cultural attitudes and different attitudes to how we identify with Australian, with, with, with our national identity. I guess one of the concerning parts in that um, is, is that, is that the important role of financial well-being mm -hmm. and that financial stress <laughs> and the fact that the biggest declines in national belonging include among those who, who are experiencing financial difficulties and that sense of uh, economic difficulty and economic in inequality affecting people's connectedness and their yeah. sense of belonging nationally. That's a really critical concern. Oh, absolutely. Um, the second question I have is that um, the survey is unique to Australia, but is there, um, uh, <laughs> sorry, inferential data about how other countries score on similar measures? So that's the mapping of cohesion <laughs> survey. It's unique in the world, isn't it? It is. It is absolutely. But we did. We just this morning had a look at some Canadian findings, uh, which suggest that it's very, very similar uh, in the in that particular space. Australia's uh, level of um, support for multiculturalism is higher than it is in Canada, but certainly the Canadian levels of um, belief in uh, immigration are all very similar to to what they are here too. Mm. We also pull out some results in, in our report, which you can see online, from the World Values Survey and the European Values Study. And that has a couple of measures which we can track over time and compare to some, of, some other countries around the world. Um, and so Australia does reasonably well, certainly among developed countries, on, on for example, the extent to which we trust other people um, and, our, and our sense of national pride in Australia. But on that measure, in that study, national pride has also been coming down in Australia over time. Thanks, James. Um, <clears throat> not an unexpected question because we have had it before, uh, which is, can you please detail the methodology further? How were these 5,800 respondents sourced? So do you want to talk to the Life in Australia panel and what that is? That's right. So the Life in Australia panel was set up by the Social Research Centre. It was that in uh, around 2018, mm -hmm. wasn't it? And, and so they've randomly recruited people um, through telephone and online methods to, be part, to join a part of the panel. And so the, the panel in 2022 is growing and there's over 7,000 people on the panel. And they'll be invited to um, uh, participate in, in a survey on a monthly basis. And every year they're asked to participate in the, multi -so uh, the mapping social cohesion study. We, we should say that this is the only um, what's called probability panel in Australia, which means that it is um, designed specifically to not be an opt-in, so one with, which would have a degree of bias in it. Uh, but to have individuals who actually participate in the panel because they've been sourced to be representative of the Australian population. So I think that's important. Um, is the data that you have collected at the neighbourhood level disaggregated by local government area? If not, which categories did you use? So I think this relates to lots of people have been interested in the data at that local government level. They want to know specifically whether or not we can tell whether or not what's happening in Parramatta or what's happening in Wyndham and that sort of thing. Because of the way that the panel is constructed, uh, even though they gather information about the uh, particular postcodes that people responding come from, uh, that information is not passed on to us for privacy reasons because there is a possibility of being able to identify people so in actual fact, we're not able to disaggregate to the local government area um, at all. But there's, as you mentioned at the very beginning, there are something like 26 different demographic er um, mm. criteria indicators, yeah. indicators that we can use to 
then look at education level or um, a whole variety of different elements for the individuals that are participating. And further to the great question above, which I believe is then the one about the disaggregation, could you please share key highlights on the profile of the sample that represent Australians in this research? Well, the, the, the survey is designed to be as representative of, of Australia as possible. Um, and, and so as a random survey, or, or recruiting people through sort of uh, randomly calling people and getting people on the panel, that ensures a kind of statistical validity in, in ensuring that um, our survey is, is um, representative of all of Australians. And so we make sure that the survey is representing Australia in terms of their, their age, their sex, their, their state, and whether they live in a major city or non-major city, and their education. And we also do a lots of other checks to make sure that it's matching up with um, a national data, particularly from the census, to make sure that we're, we're getting a really nice and complete picture of, of Australia as a whole. Ah, can trust in government be broken into individual institutions, e.g. police, etc.? Uh, not through our survey, but, um, but we do know that, that um, trust in governmental institutions does vary considerably from other data that's been collected. Mm. So, for, for example, in Australia, the ABS General Social Survey is a good source of information on trust in, in other types of institutions apart from government. Yeah. How can we create greater opportunities to, to engage across culture. Few opportunities exist to engage beyond silos, uh, while many do not engage in a MC vision? Multicultural. Multicultural vision, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't seen it written in that way before. <laughs> so how can we create greater opportunities to engage across culture? And, and I think one of the things that is um, important to note is that strong level of um, uh, sense of belonging within neighbourhood and neighbourhood isn't necessarily suggesting that that's an, any one singular community uh, but it is often quite diverse communities that are coming together so that is engagement across those particular cultures and uh, I would encourage people to read our narrative on Blacktown uh, to get some ideas about how to engage across different cultures because that really does highlight how very effectively one particular local government area has been able to do that. Um, but that said, there are a multitude of different mechanisms and it would be uh, remiss of me not to mention Welcoming Australia and the work that they do with Welcoming Cities as well uh, as places to go and source some of that information. The next question says, what portion of the sample was multilingual? What are the findings about the uh, sense of belonging uh, for people whose first language is not Eng uh, English experience? And clearly there were a number of times when you mentioned the difference between uh, people from an English speaking background versus those from a non-English speaking background. Yeah, that's right. And, and so um, we capture in particular the people who are born overseas um, and, and distinguish them by whether they're coming from an English or non-English speaking background uh, based on the, the, the fir their first language. Um, and, and so belonging does t on the average tend to be lower for those non-English speaking overseas born groups. But as, as I mentioned during the presentation, a lot of that is, is a function of time spent in Australia building those social connections and resources in Australia. That's not to say that issues like discrimination don't also ha have, a, have a play to part there as well. But we do see that that sense of belonging and that sense of engagement in, in people's communities does increase the longer that people have been in Australia. And that gap between, uh, say, the Australian-born population and the, and the foreign-born population from non-English speaking gaps, backgrounds closes the longer that people have been in Australia. Yeah. Um, so what is the current level of acceptance of migration? And is this uh, still linked to sentiments about uh, the level of unemployment? Yeah, and, that, and that's a great question. Um, so the acceptance of migration, it's certainly in the report, and you can have a look in the report. I can't recall the exact <laughs> figures. I don't know the, the figures my myself, head. but it is actually quite high. Um, it, it's uh, most people, the vast majority of people, certainly, um, are very accepting of um, immigration being an important component of Australia and, uh, and very accepting of, mi of um, migration coming from anywhere. Uh, there's not a preference for any one particular area and I think the vast majority also uh, recognise that it, there's a, a huge value to Australia mm -hmm. through migration. So um, thank you for that. Uh, let's see. 
Uh, can you please uh, talk more about possible or potential social polarisation on the basis of this result? Which result? Um, not terribly sure. Well, I guess, it, you know, th there are some areas of, of polarisation that perhaps emerge from, from some of our findings, particularly, you know, around issues like the voice to parliament and some of the other major issues where we, where we still see a, a sense of polarisation. I think it's important though not to overstate it too much. I'm sure that lots of other countries, given some of their um, election outcomes in, in just in recent weeks and months, would love to have our relatively low levels of polarisation in Australia. But it, but it is something to be careful of, particularly in the, in the world that we currently inhabit, isn't it? I, th I think it's important to note that the trust in government level has not dropped to the pre-pandemic levels. It's actually still a little bit higher than that. And I think that's probably a result of the fact that this survey was done after the election. And so there, there is um, a bit of a um, breathing room, if you like, that we're giving to the current uh, government uh, at the federal level to really prove whether or not they deserve our trust going forward. And I think that'll be quite interesting to see what happens over the next 12 months. Multiculturalism can mean different things to different people. That's very true. Um, how did you make sure that survey participants subscribed to the same or similar definition? Well, we didn't, did we? We don't. No. <laughs> we so, don't. so we let people define multiculturalism as they like. But we, ha we have a, a set of qu other questions as well to help us sort of dig deeper into this. Yeah. So, for example, you know, we ask about whether, whether people feel that uh, people coming here from overseas are, um, you know, adopting Australian values, for example. And we have questions on whether, whether, whether immigrants coming from overseas are, um, whether they think they're taking Australian jobs, for example. Um, so we can measure it a whole, across a whole set of m issues and questions, their attitudes towards um, immigration and multiculturalism. And so we, and we still see, for example, you know, a certain degree of, of, of prejudicial attitudes or negative attitudes towards some group, despite many of them still saying that multiculturalism has been good for Australia. So clearly people do import it, um, interpret it in different ways, but multiculturalism as a symbol um, and an ideal in Australia is really strong and really powerful. Yes, that's very true. Now, what strategies can be put in place to develop a safe place, safe space for multicultural peoples to interact with each other? That's a very interesting question. And I do think that there is um, there's a, an awful lot of positive things about Australia. And so I wouldn't want to suggest that Australia as a whole is not a safe place for people to interact with others from a whole variety of different cultures. Uh, that's certainly not the findings that we have at all. Um, and I think um, it's, it's a, that certainly, I mean, there are clearly some individuals who are experiencing discrimination or would, may not feel comfortable in certain spaces, uh, but s t continuing on the sort of work that we need to do to encourage people to be quite open and welcoming is really important. Did you want to make any comments about that? No, I think that was, that was really well put. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question that focused on racism you mentioned an increase in awareness about racism, but was there an increase on people reporting incidents of racism? And uh, I, I can comment, but you can comment too. <laughs> no, so, so we, haven't in, report, we haven't found an increase in the reporting of incidents of racism. Um, so t to the extent that we can be confident in that result, and I think we can, we've got mm -hmm. a, a big survey. Um, and as I say, 16% of people reported discrimination in 2022, similar to um, last year. And it was up around about 20% um, a few years ago. Um, so that awareness of racism may reflect greater, just greater public awareness. And I think during COVID, there was a during lot of COVID. talk, uh, certainly about um, racism around um, f a number of different um, cultural groups uh, for all sorts of ridiculous reasons. But uh, that has, has probably created a greater sense of knowledge within um, the way it's been reported in mainstream media and otherwise and um, online, certainly that may well have given people the impression that it was a much bigger issue than it probably is. But certainly those people that are ex experiencing discrimination, there is some differential between which communities are experiencing more than others, as, as you showed in the slides. Um, but their, the level of that experience has stayed the same uh, year in, year out. So. Um, how did the study increase accessibility and allow for non-English speaking individual voices to be included? Uh, the, 
The survey is conducted in English. It's not connected conducted in um, multiple languages, unfortunately. It's not something that we've been able to, to do. And the um, increasing numbers of people that are on the panel has also looked to try to increase as many people as, uh, as much as they possibly can of people from different cultural backgrounds. Um, so we rely very heavily on the work of the Social Research Centre to continue to increase the diversity of those people. And as, um, as we can see, it's, um, it's now gone up to 7,000 people that are on the panel. Uh, so that increased diversity is clearly coming through as well, helps us in the analysis that we do. Is there a possibility of doing mini follow-up surveys targeting certain communities, uh, such as the Sudanese and the Lebanese, etc.? It is absolutely possible to do follow-up surveys. It's difficult to do it as a, as a broad, survey across that entire community, uh, whichever one you choose to, to actually do, uh, for a whole variety of reasons. But the work that we do on the qualitative side, so doing interviews with individuals from different communities, helps to add a lot of that granularity to the, um, to the work that we do. As the, I'll give this one to you, Jay. Social cohesion is also about creating shared values. Is it concerning that people are becoming siloed <coughs> in their belonging to a community, but not to the nation. It's certainly something to, to think about and consider. Not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, we, we need to do some more work on that. But certainly that, that in, and what came through particularly strongly from our interviews is that that sense of belonging and community within neighbourhoods was quite strong in, in some, some very diverse communities, uh, communities across Australia that you know, either they have really high established levels of ethnic diversity with people coming to Australia from all corners of the world, or, the, or their diversity has increased quite a lot over the last 20 years. And what was really encouraging is that people were telling us that they've become more connected across groups within those communities as well. Um, so that, that siloed, silo issues is a concern in, in terms of that sort of belonging, the difference in belonging at that national, local and national level. And so that leads us to that critical question of, you know, how can we, you know, so draw on that strength of, of neighbourhood cohesion for the, for the benefit of national cohesion? Um, ab absolutely. I think it's very important when we talk about shared values. I wouldn't want to suggest that there is anybody that comes to live to us in Australia that doesn't have similar values to the broader population that they're joining. Um, most, the vast, virtually everybody is coming because they want their children to be educated. They want their families to have a good life. The, all those sorts of values, they're respectful of um, institutions, Th those sorts of things uh, absolutely exist. So I would hate to suggest that there are silos of people that don't have values in common with the broadest population in Australia. So, uh, Did you ask about experience of disability in the survey as well? And if so, what were some of the findings about for people with disabilities? And we, we don't ask questions about disabilities. We don't, do we? no. There are some other good surveys that capture information on, on disability a little bit better than we do, but... Um, oh, do, yes, <laughs> than we do, do at all. At all. <laughs> yes. Um, do you or will you report on any intersectional findings, uh, such as the experiences of migrant women, for example? Uh, well, certainly that it's possible to do some segmenting of the data so that it, we, we could look at the experience of women from non-English speaking backgrounds um, and, and what their experience has been in certain areas. But we certainly haven't done it for this particular presentation at the moment. No, but it's one of the exciting features of the big sample this year. Absolutely. Um, is that we'll, we will be able to do more of this, this type of analysis. Absolutely. And, re and re remember the survey is, is a, you know, it's a public data set and a, and a public asset. So we'll be putting it up in the, in the, social, uh, the yeah. Australian Data Archive. Absolutely. It'll be available to researchers to continue to explore. But these questions are also really valuable because we, um, as a result of uh, the recognition of the huge density of information that's in the, um, in the report and in the data that we collect, uh, we've now uh, produced publication called Social Cohesion Insights which looks at some of these individual pieces. And so the questions that we see coming through as to we've got an interest in this area, uh, allow us to then produce a social cohesion insights that responds to that. And I think that's a really good question uh, to do that with. How can we increase the level of awareness education regarding what voice to parliament means and its importance? Well, I think that one of the key things emerging is about 
appropriate in language uh, information for people, particularly for people coming from uh, non English speaking backgrounds, to make sure that they're, they're aware of what's going on and they have some knowledge of what it, what it, what it means and what it potentially means for them and, and what it could mean in the future, um, and hopefully in a respectful and, and constructive way as well. I, I think it's also important not to presume that those people that have arrived in the last five years, ten years, um, or even longer for that matter, actually understand how Parliament works or how politics works. So there's probably a role for creating some foundational information uh, in language, as you say, um, and, and in a way that is really easy to comprehend, uh, and not so that different to the way that we, the, the uh, techniques that we learnt around COVID. And, uh, and the sort of needs for um, both video communications as well as written communications, as well as um, verbal face-to-face um, -face type uh, communications within a whole variety of communities to give a full depth of understanding and not simply whether or not you should vote yes or no. Which group in Australia experiences the lowest levels of social cohesion, belonging, etc.? That is age, cultural background, socioeconomic status, etc. I guess the, the strongest predictors of social cohesion or the, or the factors that um, most commonly related to, to social cohesion, uh, particularly around age and, and sort of financial situation. Um, so as I s said in the presentation, younger people report a lower level of um, social cohesion, at least on the sort of belonging domains uh, and the sense of worth and the sense of social inclusion and justice. On, on acceptance and rejection, Younger people are generally higher because they, they've historically had a higher sense of um, acceptance of people from, from different backgrounds and, and ethnic diversity in Australia. Uh, one, of the, one of the exciting things is that the, the increase in support for multiculturalism has been really strong for, for older Australians as well, which has been really encouraging. But that, also that experience of, of financial stress and that relationship with social cohesion is, is a sort of worrying thing. That's, We've found that in the, certainly in the last couple of years that's been the, the, the strongest predictor of social cohesion. So people who, who say that they are financially struggling uh, you know, report, again, lower sense of belonging in Australia, uh, lower sense of, of worth, uh, less social inclusion and justice, um, and, and a lower sense of acceptance and rejection as well. Mm -hmm. Ah, <clears throat> well, this is the challenge. What are your recommendations to government? at national, state and local levels to address the findings that we've got? <laughs> um, well, well, there's lots of data that, that, that we can um, come and try to um, come up with some really good solutions. Uh, the cost of living pressures is obviously a big one. Um, building on that support for multiculturalism and to make sure that we continue to have a really strong um, multicultural society that is cohesive as well. Um, addressing some of those um, polarising topics, particularly around things like the voice to parliament and making sure that we, we handle that respectfully and well. Um, there's lots of, lots of, lots there, of There are ideas. lots of recommendations. I do think um, at, the, at the very core of it is really ensuring that those people that are really uh, struggling to pay bills and, and having really financial issues have some sense, as they were given in, with JobKeeper and JobSeeker, given some sense that there is uh, there is a, a safety net there to help them and that they have some reason to be optimistic about the future. I think that's particularly important. But also you want governments to really recognise the strengths of our multicultural society. The fact that people are incredibly positive about the diversity, so not to create issues where there aren't any, uh, but to continue to actually um, build that sense of pride in Australians for what they've managed to achieve over the last 50 years or so in building that openness and generosity around uh, diversity. So I think that's a particularly important message that government can, uh, can portray to everybody else. Can you draw any inferences from the survey about how respondents define multiculturalism? We certainly can. So just from that suite of questions that we, we have in the survey. So for example, um, I talked about the um, the extent to which people think that ethnic diversity has made Australia stronger, the extent to which people feel that um, immigrants take away jobs, the extent to which people feel that um, immigrants contribute to the Australian economy and to Australian society and culture. 
extent to which people think that um, government should provide support for people from, from different backgrounds. And so, so we can combine some of these questions to get a sense of, of what people mean. And there is some variation, um, but encouragingly, it's not just on multiculturalism that, that the trends have been increasing, but the trends have been increasing on all these different indicators, as, as so to say that um, multiculturalism is increasingly seen that is something that's all embracing and accepting people um, and embracing people of different backgrounds and different belief systems um, and and um, I guess less less about you know sort of a sort of cultural homogeny in Australia or, or the sense to which people need to have the same values but acceptance that that people do come to Australia with with similar core values um, but express themselves in all different ways as well. I, I think um, Andrew Marcus used to refer to multiculturalism as a brand mm. and it is mm. something that uh, that sits up there at a, at a very um, macro level if you like that people can feel very proud of. What ha then happens at the neighbourhood level is is particularly important as well and I think that experience at the neighbourhood level compared to this macro brand uh, is seen to be working quite well um, because you do have this sense of belonging, this sense of openness, this sense of um, that, that uh, the number of people, actually I'm not sure that you mentioned that James, the number of people whose friends are from mm, backgrounds. Did you want to mention that now, the, what the statistics were about that? Yes, so that, I think that was 80% of people say they have two or more friends um, from different backgrounds and I think 40% uh, have friends from five or more friends in their close circle of friends from different backgrounds. So, uh, different faith or, or cultural mm. backgrounds to themselves, which is a, just a, an, an amazing statistic and, and an incredibly powerful way of demonstrating that multiculturalism does have some reality at that micro level as well as the macro brand. Absolutely. What kind of impact on findings, e.g. discrimination and belonging, would the survey being available in English only have, is this recognised in your report? So at a national level, I'd, I'd say that the differences would be minimal, um, but, but it probably does impact our ability to really sort of drill down um, to, to sp for specific groups, particularly some of those sort of, I guess, non-English speaking group and, and recently arrived non-English speaking groups. Um, we'd, we'd perhaps use other sources to try and get, it, get at their experience of discrimination. Um, but uh, in, in being able to look at these national trends, um, the, the effect is not necessarily as great. No, and, and I think it's important to say that we are really committed to wanting to ensure that we do capture the voice of as many people um, <coughs> from, <coughs> excuse me, non-English speaking backgrounds as well as uh, those that, uh, that are responding to the surveys it currently is. Interesting to hear older Australians' positive attitudes towards diversity increase so much in the last few years. What do you think is driving that? <laughs> I'll give that to you, James, while I have a drink. That, it's a great question and something that we'll be looking more into as to, as to what's driving this. Um, we've certainly seen, um, you know, Australia has become so much more diverse just in the last 15, 20 years. And more people experience of diversity, have that experience of diversity, as we're saying, more people have friends from different backgrounds, so that exposure to diversity. Um, and so, so, so on, that on the ground level of experience and exposure to diversity, um, and that sense in which that um, people from different backgrounds um, are lovely people and, and <laughs> we connect well with each other and, and we can all be friends and we find those commonalities with each other. And I th think probably also at the top down national level as well, you know, a positive discourse around, around the, the benefits and value to multiculturalism in Australia is really powerful too and has the potential to, you, you know, um, uh, strengthen attitudes, particularly among groups like older Australians who, you know, I guess traditionally haven't had quite the same level of support. How can you be sure that survey participants were expressing feelings towards immigrants slash people, not towards specific countries slash governments? Well, we specifically ask about, you know, the, the people coming from these different countries and, and so quite clear that it's about people and not about countries and, and governments. It is all about the wording and the questions. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, were there any identified areas with neighbourhoods that strongly facilitated social cohesion? Um, 
Well, probably not from the, the questions that we've asked probably don't necessarily cover identified areas within neighbourhoods um, that facilitated social cohesion, I guess we could presume, <clears throat> but, um, but we don't ask questions in there that uh, specifically look at um, local councils or libraries or uh, areas within particular neighbourhoods. So, yeah? Yeah. Are there <clears throat> any areas in the findings where Australian-born and overseas-born respondents' attitudes differ significantly? Uh, same for regional versus metro. So the, I guess there are some areas, particularly on the, on, on, so I brought up the, the questions of belonging and participation and talked particularly about that being a function of time. So that, that were probably the biggest difference in the surveys. Um, but as I say, they, they, even those differences tend to disappear the longer that people have been in Australia. Um, overseas born populations generally have high levels of trust in, in other people and in governments and high level of trust or high level of acceptance of differences in diversity in society. Um, you did see some equalising too, didn't you, between um, uh, the Australian born population on some dynamics? Yeah, so for example, that awareness of racism, for example, yeah. question, where in the past, or at least in 2020, um, the, the overseas born population were much more likely to say that racism is a problem in Australia, but just in the last two years that's evened up. Now mm -hmm. they're at similar, similar levels. And rural, regional, metro? There is um, some evening up there as well, isn't there? Yeah, particularly on that, the, the, that support for multiculturalism, ethnic diversity in Australia. So again, yeah. perhaps that experience of, of increasing diversity, particularly in some of our regional centres across Australia, um, is incri incri sorry, contributing to a really impressive increase in support on those measures in outside the major cities. Yeah. Is it fair to conclude that concerns for social cohesion are more about inequality than diversity? And I think, I think that's probably a very reasonable assumption to make. Inequality does, um, particularly this year, has really highlighted how um, the, the effect that that has on social cohesion or perceived inequality or even experienced inequality as, as it is reported. That, that differential has made a huge difference on, um, on social cohesion at the moment. I, I don't think, I think what we're seeing is that uh, Australians' acceptance of diversity is is there. Um, so it's these other factors that seem to, to vary that are giving people these differing impressions around social cohesion. Mm. Yeah? Yeah, exactly. Measures have been adjusted following the change from telephone to email. What is the methodology used to adjust for interviewer effect in telephone interviews? Well, well in, the, in, the, in the report up today on the, on the website, we don't t tend to um, using explicit measures to, to adjust for the interview effect. So we're sort of being transparent in how we're conducting the survey and how that change is made and, and how the, it's affected the results and talk about those effects on the results. But it, I mean, one of, one of the really great things when that transition was made in 2018 is, was that there were surveys conducted in 2018 and 2019 that, were bo that both used the online, primarily online surveys and the telephone surveys. And so we could measure the extent to which um, there was this interior effect. Um, so, so in further analysis, that, that's one way in which we can, we can adjust for that interior effect. Um, but we also want to be transparent in, in, in the methodology and our approach to the survey as well as much as possible. It has been very carefully studied so that we can wait for the right things in, in that process. Um, was there any qualitative data collected? <coughs> <coughs> Certainly in... Um, 2021, we did uh, quite an extensive amount of qualitative research to support uh, that particular report. This year, we also did some qualitative work, but we went back to a number of the people that we'd interviewed in 2021. And so that uh, there's a whole chapter in the report that talks to those particular experiences. Was there anything that stood out to you, James? Because you did some of those interviews as well, didn't you? I did. And so, and so I guess one of the, th gave some really powerful insights and, and, su and support for some of our survey findings as well. So the extent to which, particularly some of our diverse communities in Australia are really places of resilience and strength um, and, and the ways in which they did connect with each other through the pandemic. Um, but there are struggles out there and for some people, it does seem as if we're moving from crisis to crisis and moving from COVID-19 to floods to economic pressures. And 
And so that, I mean, that gives us some important context as to why social cohesion might be decline in, declining in 2022. And, and I guess relief from some of these pressures um, kind of gives us the sense that um, if, if we can sort of work through these challenges and, and draw on the strength of our communities to, to manage these challenges, I, I think there are, you know, we can imagine an even stronger and more cohesive Australia in coming years. Um, while attitudes towards multiculturalism have been positive, is it possible that this may not translate to equal opportunities in civic life, e.g. employment? Yes, that's certainly true. So that's, I guess that's another um, stream of work to, to, um, to ensure that, that people pr um, coming to Australia from different backgrounds and other sorts of populations are getting those opportunities in life, um, with education, employment. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> we, do, we do know that there's discrimination in, um, in workplaces. Um, that's been, uh, you know, we've discovered that before. Uh, but one of the interesting things has been through COVID and the lack of immigration, uh, that suddenly quite a number of businesses have been reaching out to organisations uh, which would be recruiting people who've otherwise found it very difficult to get employment. And so the demand has built up in that particular space. I think there's um, other issues to do with whether or not that actually creates a career path for individuals. But, uh, but that said, I do think there's, um, COVID has created a little bit of a, an opportunity for people to become more familiar with um, employing people that maybe they might not have given a chance to before. Trust in government spiked during COVID. What does the data suggest was behind that, given results uh, have now returned to lower levels? <laughs> Just job keeper, job seeker. <laughs> That's right. That strong policy response, protecting our health and our financial well-being. Um, through the crisis, you know, it, and it's still, as you say, it, it has come down, um, but it's still above its sort of longer term average. So there's still an opportunity for, for the current government to um, benefit from, from that trust and try to kind of maintain it at, at reasonably high levels. Maybe um, get it going up again. Get it going <laughs> up again. So ne next 12 months is, it would be really key. <laughs> if we improve an individual's feelings of belonging with personal development, outreach and active programs, can we extrapolate this out to the, cu the country level? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, I mean, it's, uh, um, I mean, there's certainly ways in which, which we can start to do that. And I, th and I think that would be, you know, sort of a, a powerful way in which we could um, think about ways to, on the ground ways to sort of strengthen belonging. Um, I think it's important to say that belonging is quite a multifaceted thing. So um, no one single program could actually convert somebody over to feeling belonging if they hadn't felt it before. But everything that people experience um, in, in every aspect of their daily life and then um, overall their aspirations uh, for life in general all have a contribution towards whether or not somebody feels like a sense of belonging. So um, it takes everything. Um, and I would encourage as many people as possible to work on that. Um, such a wonderful report with so much information. Thank you very much. Um, wondering whether you are planning any sub-reports exploring some of the key themes in a bit more detail. And that's very much the, the purpose of the Social Cohesion Insights. Um, and I should uh, recognise Dr John Van Coy, who writes those for us uh, in conjunction with James. Um, but I would um, encourage people to have a look at the previous publications and the, they will start up again in the not too distant future that, uh, reflecting back on this particular uh, report. So um, I would encourage you to look at those. But there may well be others um, because we, we get um, very enthused about the type of data that exists within this report and are really very excited about trying to get that information out there as much as possible. Young people are social media natives, hence they might feel more connected to a global community of shared interest rather than a nation. Is this included? Well, I think we, we perhaps might be picking up on some of that in, in, to the extent that younger people do generally express a lower sense of national belonging um, than, than older people, for example. So that might play into the kind of, particularly around the sort of social and cultural values and ideals that shape how people identify and into what they identify with. Um, they also experience the, you know, the, the largest decline in belonging over those last 15 years. Um, as I say, so 
you know, what's driving that will be re one of those really interesting, interesting areas for future research. And John has a an insight report on on belonging as well yeah. that's worth a read, on that covers some of these points as well. Um, of course, those social and cultural attitudes we also need to keep in mind. Those, those the, you know, the, I guess the socio-economic pressures and the financial pressures and their relationship with belonging as well. But although it doesn't necessarily um, relate directly to the social media side. Do you think there's a relationship between um, the level of education and people's sense of being a global citizen and that their opportunities actually can exist beyond the borders of Australia? I think that's true. Um, but it'd be, I guess it'd be an interesting one to you yeah, know, kind investigate, of investigate <laughs> further. <Yeah>. Another one. <laughs> uh, what can governments and community leaders take away from this year's findings in terms of what needs to happen next? Well, I think we sort of addressed that a little bit earlier. Um, th there is, um, I think um, governments and, and um, others that might be interested in this space need to recognise that this particular report and being able to look at trends over time is incredibly important when you're thinking about these sorts of issues that affect people in a very, a very significant way. Um, and uh, so understanding that there are such important things, strengths in Australia and how Australia has actually um, uh, embraced its diversity and been very accepting of people coming with a whole variety of different types of contributions that they make to our society. And I think it's really important that that's um, one of the, the lights on the hill, if you like, that keep driving people forward to recognise um, the, the, the type of individuals that exist here and, uh, and how important that is. Um, participating and being educated in the referendum uh, equal a great nation building, a great nation building exercise. How can grassroots complement organisations to include all, especially multicultural? See, I've figured out that one. <laughs> <laughs> this comes back to that, uh, that question about the, um, what we learned uh, during, about communications during COVID and for those people that don't understand, and that I'm not suggesting for one minute that that is simply people from non-English speaking backgrounds or um, minority communities. There are lots of people that don't necessarily know how um, civics and, and um, our governments work uh, within Australia. So I think there's broad piece of work that needs to be done. Absolutely agree that it is a great nation building exercise uh, there and that um, point that you make about it being a respectful discussion is absolutely essential in, uh, in going forward. What does the data tell us about the priorities for strengthening Australia's social cohesion in the next few years? Well, I guess, I guess the key thing emerging for me was about addressing some of those social and economic inequalities um, and that... Inflation. Inflation, <laughs> the cost of living, those financial pressures, um, because they do have a big bearing on, on social cohesion. Um, but there's also lots of innovative stuff that we can do within communities to try and strengthen, further strengthen the kind of social support, social infrastructure, the kind of activities and, and um, support services that can encourage that the, the degree of mixing and, and the, the, I guess the strengthening of, of, of you know, the benefit of diversity and cohesion generally in, within and across communities. And I think that does have the potential to flow up to national level cohesion as well, particularly with the right sort of messaging coming from government and media and, and so forth about, um, you know, all the, all the great things about yeah. multiculturalism and modern Australian life. I think the next question actually taps straight into that exact same thing, which is how, how do economic and geopolitical issues interact with social cohesion? and how powerful an influence is the public debate around some of these issues. And, and that really taps in as well to the role of media in contributing to how these um, geopolitical and economic issues are dealt with. Uh, certainly from a geopolitical um, uh, side of things, you can think back into uh, the pandemic and how uh, the narratives around particular countries really did affect how people viewed uh, individuals and, and um, co different cultures within Australia. So we know that they can have quite significant impacts. Uh, but as you just mentioned, the sorts of things that we need to be thinking about in Australia over the next few years from a financial perspective, uh, or uh, individuals' own financial circumstances, just very important. 
and then I think we're almost at the end of the questions that we've got here. So, um, what what insight uh, do you do young people's attitudes provide about the potential future of social cohesion in Australia? What a great question to finish on, because to be perfectly honest, the the, um, the data that we've gotten, and James, you may want to make some comments about that as well. The young people are so open to um, to diversity to um, just what the future holds. It's a really important, um, uh, what's that, um, sort of segment of society that we should be building on and maximising and, and, um, and really in harnessing as much as we possibly can. Yeah, yeah. And there's, uh, there's lots of challenges that, that young people face and, and helping, helping young people manage and navigate those challenges and, and, and bear the, you know, the more difficult things I think will be key. But you know, that, that level of support for, for difference and diversity in Australia is, is now just ingrained in young people so and, powerful. and evidenced by, you know, just having the, the, the friends from different backgrounds. Absolutely. You know, that, that experience just becomes so innate and ingrained in people that, um, you know, it's going to be really powerful and, and exciting oh. to see. Absolutely. How that and I hope people will, um, uh, well, first of all, I should say thank you to you, James, for. Um, we are out of time from uh, regard to the questions and I do invite everyone to continue the conversation online using the hashtag social cohesion report but I do want to recognise the enormous amount of work that these reports take and, uh, and want to thank James uh, for all of that. Uh, it really is extraordinary and um, I would uh, also like to encourage people to visit uh, scanlaninstitute.org.au uh, slash report 2022 to explore this year's findings because as you will have noticed there is a lot more information in there than we've been able to cover just in this very short amount of time. Um, a reminder also that the recording of today's session will be available from tomorrow uh, right here on the Bettercast platform. Simply return to this particular URL tomorrow uh, where there'll be an option to watch or to download the content for the next 14 days. You can also learn more about social cohesion from some fascinating speakers through our Voices of Australia podcast, which you can find wherever you source your podcasts. In the lead up to this year's report um, and returning in the new year, as I've mentioned, are our Social Cohesion Insights, which pick up key data points in the Mapping Social Cohesion report and provide further interpretation. And I'd encourage you to seek these out as well as on the Scanlon, Fan Scanlon Institute website. Finally, our latest narrative on political participation is also available called You Can't Be What You Can't See, written by Carolyn Zielinski. It's a really great overview of the need for more diversity in our politics and civic engagement. A very big thank you again to Dr. James O'Donnell from the Australian National University for all of your work over the last few months. And uh, to all of you who've tuned in from across the country to join us for today's launch, thank you as well. Have a great afternoon and we do hope to see you all again soon.